Let's Take This Outside with Marianne Iveson, the podcast where she speaks to athletes, outdoor professionals, and scientists about why they connect with nature. Molly Herford is a writer in love with all things cycling, running, nutrition, and movement related. When not outside, she's writing about being outside and healthy habits of athletes. She created the Consummate Athlete Weekly Podcast, website and book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete with her husband, cycling coach, Peter Glassford. Molly is a little obsessed with getting people, especially women, psyched on outdoor adventure and being outside. That's why she created The Shred Girls, a young adult fiction series, an online community focused on getting girls excited about bikes. Additionally, she's the author of multiple nonfiction books and writes regularly for publications like Bicycling Magazine and Outside. Here is the wonderful Molly Herford. Molly Herford, welcome to Let's Take This Outside. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. Also, best podcast name ever. I Do you like it? it? I yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, so I'm currently working on uh, like new branding and stuff too. So maybe I'll send you it before. Please. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you were recommended to me by Hannah Parrish, a previous guest on the podcast. And when I was looking at your Insta and your website, I'm like, yes, I need this woman on. So we were kind of talking off the podcast, but let's bring it to the recorded version. How do you know Hannah? Oh my gosh. Hannah and I go way back beyond me ever moving to Ontario. We knew each other back when I was first working for Cyclocross Magazine, which I, it's like horrific because I'm like, oh my gosh, that was 13 or 14 years ago now. And we met at a bike trade show because uh, she was actually down in the States working for Canada at the time. And we we kind of were like casual friends from that. And then suddenly I was dating this guy in Ontario up here in Collingwood, uh, where I now live. We've now been married for you know six, six or seven years. Um, and uh, Hannah, as it turns out, lives up here and is actually from here. So we kind of re-overlapped and it turned out we got dogs within two weeks of each other during the pandemic. Uh, so our dogs have grown up together. They're best friends. And now we get to have our coffee and and puppy play dates every week, which is fantastic. Okay, so where are you from originally then? I'm from New Jersey, actually. Okay, so I wasn't even planning on asking you about this, but coming from New Jersey to Ontario to Collingwood area, that's a great place to play outside, right? So what's it like living in Ontario compared to where you grew up? So the funny thing is uh, when people think of New Jersey, you think of the Jersey Shore, the terrible MTV show, which I loved and watched religiously when it was out. But I grew up in very farmland, New Jersey, so about as far from the Jersey Shore as you can get. So honestly, Collingwood, compared to where I grew up, pretty similar, like very, like really great biking, really great riding, running, everything. Uh, But Collingwood does have a little more by way of skiing than we have in New Jersey, Uh, which I have not quite mastered, to be totally honest. Uh, Don't really plan on it. But I really love having the bay on one side, the mountain on the other. It's just like the perfect place. Are you talking downhill or cross country? (laughs) I have never downhilled, never plan on it. Uh, I like my ACLs way too much. Um, I say I am the world's worst cross country skier, and I'm trying so hard to stay that way. Because I've realized when you're good at cross country skiing, it's actually a very casual movement when you're like just trying to go forward. Whereas when I do it, it is full body, like heart rate through the roof. Just me just looking like an idiot running with my skis, basically. So it's a better workout, uh, the worse you are at it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. The less like economical you are at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The less efficient you are at it, the, the, the better workout it is. You're right. Do you skate or classic? I think you could technically call it classic, but that would be that would be an insult to classic skiers everywhere. I run while wearing my skis. Like, let's be clear here. So you're a shuffler. You you shuffle on skis. Yeah. Yeah. There's no glide. There's no grace. I, I fall over a bunch. It's it's fantastic. I had this theory though that everyone who's like a really good athlete took up cross country skiing super easily, but I guess maybe that's not. Nope. I <laughs> might be. The, maybe I'm the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> You are a writer, a podcast host, and an athlete. Super impressive. Let's start with where the love of sport and the outdoors started for you. And you said farmland, so I can relate to that. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is I was the least athletic human being on the planet growing up. Like I was the kid that faked like being sick to get out of running the mile in gym class. Uh, You know, like I think one year I faked like a sprained ankle. I pretended to throw up once. I pretended to pass out two laps into the five lap run one year in high school. So to say I was not interested in being an athlete is a bit of an understatement. Uh, 
I was very like punk rock, very bookwormy, like just everything that wasn't sports I was in. And when I was younger, I didn't really think you could be both. You're a bookworm. Therefore, you are not an athlete. And that's, that is what popular media back then taught us, right? Like, the bookish kids, the nerds, like they didn't also like go play basketball or volleyball or run or anything. They stayed inside. So I played outside a bunch as a kid, you know, with my neighbor and everything, but I was not a joiner. I didn't do sports. I rode a bike, but not for any kind of athletic purpose. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't until college that I just for some reason was just like, huh, I'm not feeling very good. And I was very into fashion journalism. That's actually what I started in and just was feeling kind of crappy. I mean, I was in my freshman year of college in New Jersey, commuting to the city to intern at a magazine and then taking like full college classes, working like nine to five at the magazine, um, still like going out to punk shows at night and eating, you know, Pizza Hut personal pan pizzas on like the train going home and then, you know, eating donuts in class, trying to like stay awake. And I was like, I feel terrible. Everything just feels the worst. And luckily, my RA my freshman year of college was an Ironman triathlete. And he he always seemed to be like bouncing with energy and just like doing great. And, you know, he's like, oh, you should you should try this. And I was like, OK, that seems reasonable. Uh, he was cool. He had tattoos. He liked punk rock. And he was an Iron Man. So I was like, all right, I, I can do that. Was he cute? He was so cute. Okay, there. Okay. I'm just gonna add yeah, like, let's be clear yeah, yeah, here. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was also attractive. Just, Super attractive. Yeah. So never never ended up dating him. But uh, I did end up doing an Iron Man because of him. So <laughs> yeah. That is such a leap, by the way. That's like a huge, huge leap. Yeah, I couldn't run a mile. So I was like, 20 when I first started running and I remember running just around the block like that made up one mile and it was terrible and I hated it but I kept doing it and then yeah signed up for my first regular triathlon like Olympic distance and then from there I think the next year after that was like okay Ironman year obviously Uh, so did that and then during that time I was like I should learn how to ride a bike better because that seems tricky and so he was like oh like Rutgers cycling team is amazing you should get on that and it turned out they actually needed a woman on the team because the point structure of our collegiate conference had changed so that um, men and women points were weighted equally. So even if you had 20 guys, if you didn't have a girl racing, you didn't get those points. So they were very happy to have me on the team and they were like, race cyclocross. So I did. And it was very muddy and messy and terrible and just the most fun ever. So I got very much into that. The fashion journalism sort of fell by the wayside as I got more and more into the the sport side. And somehow I turned into a jock, I guess. <laughs> and here we are. Still a bookworm, though. It's amazing, though, that like I, I love how you took your passion. Like I'm assuming you took your passion and your skills from journalism. And then you combined it with your new later in life found love of cycling and outdoors and running. That's such an amazing mesh of creativity. It honestly didn't occur to me to not do that. Like, that sounds sort of silly, but, like, I loved running and riding and swimming and triathlon and all that stuff, so naturally, I was going to write about it. (laughs) It just seemed like the very obvious, like, next step, and I was lucky enough that, you know, my first first article that was in Triathlete Magazine was when I was 20, I think, uh, and it was about irritable bowel syndrome and the triathlete, so it was an article, like, all about poop which is still one of my favorite articles I've ever written 15 years later. I was very lucky that they happened to go for that uh, that pitch. <laughs> and- Actually, can we dig into that a little bit? Mm-hmm. Because I think if you're an athlete and you're listening and you're like, yep, I've definitely had – do you remember any nuggets from that from that article that you that you can share now? <laughs> oh my Maybe gosh! Maybe nuggets. Nuggets yeah, is not a good word. I was to like, I'm a, so sorry. That's a terrible word to use. <laughs> that is disgusting. <laughs> um, gross. Hilarious. Uh, actually, that reminds me. Uh, this morning there was this news that uh, Lil Nas X actually had to stop a concert uh, this weekend because he had to poop. And he just like mentioned it to the audience. And I actually like put it on the Slack channel for Bicycling Magazine. And I was like, he is an endurance athlete's hero. <laughs> Did he have dairy? He had too much dairy before the show, probably. Something, yeah. something to that effect. <laughs> yeah. And I forget how he described it. It was something like little demons into the toilet bowl. So the nuggets really uh, <laughs> brings so that. Sorry. We've gone down a weird direction here. I've um, never talked about poop on my show. So this is a first. Fantastic. Because I love talking about this stuff. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, there is not really like one great solution. There is a fantastic book called The Athlete's Gut that really digs into a lot of the science behind why our guts are so messy when we when we run. But really, the thing that I've found over the years talking to countless experts on this topic is you have to know yourself and you have to pay attention, which unfortunately means like paying attention to not just what you're eating during your ride or run, but also what you're eating the meal before and the meal the night before and the lunch the day before and the breakfast the day before. Like it you know, we're talking like a 48 hour window here. So, you know, my coach now like race week for a big race, he's like, stop eating vegetables like four days before cut the fiber out, like, just keep nice, simple carbs and protein coming in, but try to keep it as like, simple, basic carbohydrate as you can, which is not good advice for normal life. We like vegetables. But it's uh, very important when you're trying to do a long run and not trying to do the porta potty sprint. The other pro tip I've learned over the years is when you're at a busy race, like a race venue that has a lot of people buzzing around, get in the porta potty line early, even if you don't have to go yet. Jump up and down a little bit if you need to, kind of work things through. Then when you use the porta potty, if there's a giant line, just get right back in it. Just keep going. <laughs> just cycle through. Because you're not doing anything anyway. You're standing around at the start regardless. So you might as well. Right. Yes, you might as well be in the line when you need it. Okay, so I can't believe we're even going down this topic, but is it something about the running motion and the jerking and the bouncing for a very long period of time that causes our guts to have issues? Yeah, it's it's the up and down motion that's just jostling everything around, but it's also the fact that the blood is getting shunted to your legs to help you actually do the running motion, uh, which means that it's being taken away from the gut, so it's not helping you digest stuff very well. Uh, so especially if you're you know taking in a lot of unknown food. So if you're eating that uh, random thing that they happen to have on, you know, race day at the uh, aid station, or, you know, you drink something a little weird, or you have something that's caffeine, your body is not really in the position to digest it super, super well. So you're probably going to be doing that porta potty sprint. Okay, so what is your I know you're not speaking for everyone. And you're just speaking for yourself. But like, what is your like pre race meal? And what do you like to eat during races? So it's funny, I've written a book on nutrition, I like lecture on nutrition all the time. And Everyone is always so shocked when I say this, but my pre-race is actually just, and this is a very New Jersey, New York thing, it's like a plain bagel with butter, like a little bit of butter. And actually, like embarrassingly, I still will drink a can of Mountain Dew before most big races, <laughs> which is like the least like cool and sexy thing to admit. But uh, you know what? It's, uh, it's caffeine and it's extra calories. And when you're going into like a hundred miler, you kind of want all of the calories you can get. And coffee with its zero calories does not give you any of that. So Mountain Dew and a bagel. <laughs> are you talking running or are you talking cycling? This would be for running. Uh, for cycling, it'd be similar. I just probably would go more coffee because I'm not really as stressed on getting in a lot of calories. Right, right, right. And do you have any during race foods that you always stick to? Yeah, I'm actually really big on drinking my calories, which isn't right for everyone. But I use Tailwind and not sponsored should be because I feel like I've talked about Tailwind so much. Over the Tailwind, <clears throat> Tailwind, listen, if anyone's listening, Molly needs the sponsorship. Just, just saying. Uh, yeah, Tailwind's unflavored is pretty good. And you can get like 800 calories into a liter and a half of water, which is a huge amount of calories for that. Because I'm not great at eating on the run, like just both the physical act and the remembering to it's just much easier for me if I know I'm getting most of my calories from water. And then if I hit the aid station and they have like a ginger cookie or something like super tasty, I can have that, but I don't have to. I'm not going to be in trouble if all I do is drink. Um, do you know Lindsay Webster? I do. Yeah. So I interviewed her on the podcast and she uh, she was racing. I think she was doing the 51K skate Gatineau Lopit here in Ottawa or just in Gatineau technically. And her calorie, she had all her calories in her camelback and it froze. And she <laughs> That's definitely your one uh, one issue, yeah. In Canada, that is an issue, yeah. Yeah. I was down, I raced my first 100 miler in February, and I had the same kind of issue. And it was fine during the day, but at night, it got below freezing. And I didn't really quite realize it. And then I went to take a drink. And yeah, like, you know, the nozzle like crunches and you're like, oh, no. So I was suddenly like putting on like all trying to like put my layers on over my hose just to try to, you know, get it to warm up enough. But the problem was then like, my layers were getting too tight, they couldn't zip over the whole pack. So I was 
literally running like it's, you know, four in the morning. I'm running with my puffy coat that I just grabbed out of the, the car because we passed the aid station. I grabbed that and I put it on backwards. So it was like undone. I'm just running with it like a smock. <laughs> just like this is the least <laughs> cool I have ever looked. Thankfully, like they only <laughs> took pictures earlier in the race where I look really competent. <laughs> <laughs> You are the expert here, but the only tips I have on this, because I, my hose is frozen so many times hiking, but all I have is I always do a thir- like the thermal hose. I always put that on or I like always blow back into it. So the water like gets out of the hose so it doesn't freeze in the hose. And so it doesn't block it. Anyway, that's my own like, that's my own hot tip. Nope. That <laughs> is an excellent hot tip. Yeah. <laughs> Considering that we're going into winter soon. Let's take this outside with Marianne Iveson. There's so many things I want to talk to you about and so many things we've already talked about. I had no idea we were going to talk about. But the common thing theme that I see for you is sharing your expertise, whether it's through writing, podcasting, coaching. Is there one that excites you more than the other? Ooh, like in terms of like writing versus podcasting, et cetera, or? Yeah. Is there something, is there something, it sounds like writing's your true first love, but yeah. is there something that excites you more? Yeah, it's definitely writing. And I've actually, it's funny, I've been thinking about this a lot in the past like few weeks. I'd say actually writing fiction is my like number one favorite thing and kind of sneaking that advice into fiction. So I have the the Shred Girls series, the three books that are about this, you know, group of young girls that finds their athletic identities and friendship and also gets into bikes and stuff. And in that, I have little like nuggets of like, oh, like when you're, you know, jumping a bike to get the feeling of being in the air, you want to feel like your ponytail is like flipping up or like when we're when we're meditating, here's what we want to be thinking about. Or like if we're doing a plank in yoga, here's like the cues to be thinking of that are just kind of woven into the dialogue of the book because it's just like my sneaky way of like giving, you know, these little nuggets of advice in there. I actually had a dad message me and he's like, so I uh, I read Lindsay's Joyride to my daughter and for the first time she is now listening about the like, you know, how to like weight the bike in the front and then like unweight it to go over stuff. And she wouldn't listen when I told her to do it. But when Phoebe, the coach, explains it suddenly she's doing it. So so it's working. I was going to actually ask you more about Shred Girls. Also, side note, are you ever going to do audiobooks? Oh my gosh. I would love to, but it turns out audiobooks are like way harder to do than podcasts. Um, I absolutely would if a publisher was like, oh yeah, we'd love to do an audiobook. Like let's, let's deal with that. But I've attempted, I guess, at uh, doing them myself just to see what it would be like. I couldn't even get through the first like page because you have to actually read the book perfectly and try to do you know a little bit of voices here and there and inflections and it's it's just so much more exacting than a podcast where you can pause awkwardly and think about what you're going to say and say like or um you can't do that in an audiobook people get mad about that you wouldn't know this at all but uh, I'm actually a voice actor so <laughs> no way that was my way of saying if you're ever doing a, an audiobook and okay. maybe we can team up somehow oh my so. gosh yeah I'm like saving contact information here <laughs> I wanted to be your friend anyway. So this yeah, is, <laughs> this works out very well. <laughs> this is working out very well. Um, I can't believe I'm like, we're like, we plugged Tailwind. I've plugged uh, me being a voice actor. This is like a commercial and no one's getting paid for anything at this point. So I know, which is very ironic because I've also written The Athlete's Guide to Sponsorship. So you'd think I'd be better at this. <laughs> By the way, this is only audio only, so you can't see it. But she's currently holding up the book. So that is unbelievable. So this is the embarrassing thing. I actually forget sometimes the books that I've written because there have been a lot of them over the years now. So I actually, when I do a podcast, and obviously people aren't going to see this, but they can maybe hear me slide it across. (laughs) (laughs) I see Fuel Your Ride, Shred Girls. Um, What else is in there? Uh, Saddle Sore, which is my Lady Parts and the Bike book. That's all about uh, how to ride more comfortably. Um, we have Becoming a Consummate Athlete, which is my and my husband's book. Uh, the Athletes Guide to Sponsorship. And then actually, I have two uh, on the note of me writing fiction and that being my first love, I guess. I have two books that I'm in the process of like figuring out. One is called The Strong Girl, and it's a middle grade, another middle grade novel. This one's historic fiction. Uh, and The Long Run, which is my first YA novel that gets a little racier. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll make sure to put a link to all of those books in the show notes. There's so right? many. You don't need to put okay. them all. <laughs> no, I'll just put like your website. Yeah, there we go. On the, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to Shrug Girls, and obviously it's connecting women to, and young girls to activity, but why is connecting women to sport and nature so important to you? Well, they always say that like every author writes the book that they wished they'd been able to read when they were kids. And to me, something like biking is awesome because no matter who you who you like quote unquote think you are as a kid, biking can still open up doors for you, right? Like you can ride to a friend's house. It gives you that independence. You can get, you know, this healthy level of activity, but you don't need to join a team to do so. You can join a team if you want. Uh, you know, you can be as invested in racing and, you know, being super serious about it if you want. Or you can be super into, you know, just spending time in nature and mountain biking or bike packing or you know it can just take you in so many different directions so I think it's a great like literal vehicle uh, and I mean it's helpful right like when you get to college having a bike helps you ride around and get to classes faster um, I don't think I could have done like my college schedule without a bike looking back um, so to me like getting girls to like bikes is just kind of this like very very important thing uh, and then flip side getting getting girls who are really into bikes and playing outside and stuff to find books that speak to them uh, equally important to me but yeah I my main impetus for writing it was do you remember the Babysitter's Club series, for example? So babysitting, inherently super boring, right? Like babysitting sucks. You're literally watching babies. You know, maybe you get to like watch a PG-13 movie when they go to bed or something, but like it's really not a fun activity. But I read those darn Babysitter Club books and I started babysitting. They made it seem so cool. <laughs> so as an adult, I was, you know, like who'd gotten very much into cycling and loved it and thinks it's just such a great, you know, form of transportation and sport and everything else. I was like, how can you get more girls into, into cycling? Because the numbers are so upsetting. Like the stats are like most kids learn to ride bikes. Like a huge percentage of kids learn how to ride a bike. But then between the ages of 8 and 11, the drop-off for girls in cycling is like 87%. They just stop. And like that was that was me. I could ride a bike, but I didn't. Boys keep riding. Girls, it's suddenly not part of their identity. It's not really encouraged. Like we're not really told to like play on our bikes. Even now, um it's it's starting to change, which is great, but like even now if I go to like a bike thing that has boys and girls you'll tend to see the boys if you stop like you stop doing the actual practice and it's just like the hangout in the parking lot after the boys keep playing you know they're like knocking each other over they're playing bike soccer or doing wheelies whatever and the girls have like all put their bikes away and they're like doing the next thing that they're supposed to be doing they're following the rules and now we're starting to see more girls like play and like do like wheelie challenges with each other. Uh, and that's that's where we really want to get because that play is what makes for amazing athletes later and just cyclists have way more fun later. <laughs> so, yeah, this is my sneaky way of like if I'd been able to read a book about a kid that biked when I was that age, I definitely would have been conned into getting on a bike. I'm like, sure, of course, I'll, I'll ride bikes. They, Lindsay did it in the book. We've kind of already chatted about it, but if someone doesn't have a hot RA to get them into triathlons, if you had any advice for people interested in starting outdoor activity um, or their athletic journey or maybe want to become an endurance athlete, this podcast is like, – I like to talk about accessibility and making it easy for people. Where can they start? What advice can you give them? Walking. Walking is so underrated, although now I guess TikTok has made like the hot girl walk thing really trendy all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So – I mean, I'm psyched on that, I think. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're getting outside. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, this is great. But honestly, I think walks are so underrated for getting started. Like, we are so often fielding questions about, like, how do I get started running? Uh, and the answer to that is usually just start walking. Like, with what you have, with the shoes that you have, with the clothes that you have, get out and go for a walk. If the walk seems really easy, try running for 30 seconds or, like, running to the stop sign ahead of you. And then walk again. And then when you feel like it, run again a little bit. The next time you do that same circuit, try to maybe run like a tiny bit more, tiny bit more, tiny bit more. Like it doesn't have to be this like overblown, like scary thing. You can start doing it by these tiny little degrees. It's it's really all about the consistency versus the intensity, we'll say. The nature aspect specifically, how much does it play into the enjoyment of everything that you do? 
Oh, so much. <laughs> like I said, I love living in Collingwood because we literally have the bay, you know, a couple hundred yards from the house and then the mountains are right on the other side. You know, so we we get out and spend time by the bay every day. We try to get into the woods whenever we can. Like for me being being out there, like that's why I started doing more of these like ultra trail running things is um we always talk about like when you're preparing like or can you prepare for the goal that you've set and do you want to? So when I was doing like triathlon and Ironman and stuff, I actually didn't love it that much because I didn't like the preparation for it. It involved a lot of hours just like on the road going in straight lines, whether you were running or riding in the pool, you're swimming laps just over and over again, you're inside. But ultra trail running, as it turns out, the best way to train for that is to play on the trails. So can I prepare for that? Yes. Do I want to? Heck yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's my that's my happy place. Tell me about your podcast, Consummate Athlete, and who is it for? I know you do it with your your husband, uh, Peter Glassford, and maybe tell tell me a little bit about your husband too, because uh, you guys a lot of your stuff's intertwined. Yeah, so much of our stuff is intertwined. So the, yeah, the podcast is um, is our joint project. We've been doing it for six years. It's now his coaching company as well. He originally started where he had Smart Athlete was his coaching company, and then we had our Consummate Athlete podcast. Um, but we sort of combined them all a couple of years ago just to be under one umbrella to make the websites a little easier. <laughs> so there, that's that. Um, so the title, which confuses a lot of people because they're like, what the hell is a consummate athlete? Um, which fair enough. Uh, but to us, it was, um, you know, how like you think of a James Bond and he's like this consummate gentleman where he can do everything. You know, he can like parachute into a casino and then suddenly he's like wearing the hell out of a tux and like, you know, winning a game of roulette, <laughs> yeah. but also like, you know, ordering just the right drink and like, then like throwing darts and like hitting the bulls out. just can do everything. Uh, we really like the idea of being these consummate athletes who are these all around athletes. Um, a lot of the time, especially in cycling, people get very like one track. It's a very two dimensional sport, but we the, the most injuries that Peter sees are actually not from cycling for his clients. They're from things like trying to pick their kids up and like throwing their backs out <laughs> or, you know, a kid jumps on them or a dog jumps on them or something. So our big thing is like armoring yourself against like everyday life. So you can do all of these adventures. And, you know, our thought had originally been a bit more James Bondy where we're like, we want to go on like all of these adventures. We want to be able to like kiteboard one day and then rock climb the next and then run a marathon and then, you know, go on a mountain bike ride and then, and, you know, bike pack or backpack out to this peak. And we kind of toned it down to just being a better all around endurance athlete, but still focusing on like cross training as this, this big part of what it is that we do. Uh, and Peter is, like I said, he's an endurance sport coach, mainly cycling coach. Uh, he does a lot of in-person stuff and he's also a bike racer. We actually met when I was covering uh, China it was having its first ever UCI cyclocross race 10 years ago or nine years ago, I guess. Uh, and we we met there for about five minutes. And then uh, he was leaving right after we met. Uh, he got on the bus, asked if anyone knew who I was. Luckily, one guy did. And he said he was going to date me. And now here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Perma he's permanently dating you now. So. Yep, yep. <laughs> I'm glad that all worked out for you guys. Me too. You're like, we should get married and start a podcast one day. Yeah, exactly. That was our first date, right? Like how many years ago? So. Yeah, yeah. We actually, and we started the podcast the year we got married. We were actually like doing a podcast. We got this coach, Dean Golich. She like works with all these Olympic cyclists and he's this amazing guy. And the only day he could do it was like the day before our wedding. So we were like at the wedding venue, like trying to podcast and like record this thing. It's still one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> At, at least you could like step out of yourself for a second and go talk about something that you love and go back to the stressful day, day right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Molly, this has been uh, unbelievable. And actually, like I'm thinking about, okay, maybe I can have her on again soon, like in the future. Anytime. Like, like this is amazing. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was such a blast. Thanks for listening. For more Let's Take This Outside, go to letstakethisoutside.ca. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.